Hey class, and welcome back to the second half of chapter seven lecture video here. So continuing on our discussion of thermodynamics and looking at the idea of the Franklin style, Franklin wood stove, all right? Why does uh, heat naturally want to flow from the stove into the rest of the room? This is something we actually have talked a little bit about already in class. So why is that? Well, ultimately because it's part of physics, um, but it's really because the stove gets hotter. It, it has a higher thermal energy, a higher temperature. And as we learned in class, right, heat is naturally going to flow from a hotter object to a colder object. Heat will naturally flow from an object with more thermal energy to an object with a lesser amount of thermal energy. Because in the natural world, things tend towards thermal equilibrium, tend towards a situation where there's no net overall temperature difference, right? Because again, temperature is the quantification or the measurement used to represent the thermal energy of an object, right? The amount of thermal energy it has per particle is really what the temperature is. So it's almost like a average thermal energy for the entire object, right? And so again, at equilibrium, the temperature is the same for all objects, and that's what nature tends to, as you've probably seen, right? If you have a nice cold can of soda, it's going to gradually absorb thermal energy from the area around it. Heat is going to flow into it. It'll warm up and eventually become exactly at room temperature. And if you have a nice hot cup of coffee, the same thing happens. Eventually, thermal energy will be lost as heat flows from it to the environment around it. And so, um, yeah, we're always seeing this idea happen. And there's things we can do to try to resist it, right? I have in my coffee cup, I always have a lid on it and I have like an insulated Yeti style cup in order to try to slow the rate of that heat flow, but inevitably it's always going to happen. So another question, just thinking about wood stoves and wrapping up kind of the beginning of chapter seven before we move on to some of the other applications. Why is it that a wood stove is better than an open fire? It's an interesting question to think about the physics involved, right? And ultimately, um, the th reason that we use wood stoves instead of open fires is actually about safety. If you just went based on efficiency alone, all right, an open fire is actually going to be the most efficient. All of the heat being released by an open fire goes into your room, but so does the smoke and the risk of burning your house down and the health problems of breathing smoke and the fact that the fire uses up oxygen in the room at a a rate that we can't easily control, right? So these are all things that make fires not super, super uh, safe in an open fire manner, even though it's the most energy efficient. But maybe an interesting question is why do we use stoves rather than like just fireplaces? Why did Ben Franklin come up with this idea of this certain type of wood stove rather than just continuing to use the enclosed fireplaces, which people had used for a long time, because an enclosed fireplace is definitely safer than an open fire. But the problem is it's also less efficient. All right. So fireplaces, while clean and safe, are less efficient. And part of that is because much of that energy that it's producing is lost and not easily transferred into the room, because not only does the hot smoke take much of the thermal energy up, but as we'll learn about here in just a little bit, natural convection makes the hot air want to flow up and the fireplace is really only able to cause thermal energy to be transferred through the front of it and much of the rest of the thermal energy because fireplaces are a lot of times built on an exterior wall and things is lost to the outside and so it's not very efficient the wood stoves if you've ever seen them they're almost always separated out in a room on all sides and so while it does lose heat to the environment, the environment is all internal to your room other than just the little bit that's carried out of the sm through the smoke. And even the smoke, Ben Franklin's design was to try to extract as much of that thermal energy as possible. So that stovepipe that carries that dangerous smoke out of the building will oftentimes again be exposed in rooms and go through floor after floor all the way out to the top so that that warm pipe can heat up each room giving off some of the thermal energy that that smoke has before it finally exits, trying to make it as efficient as possible. So it's pretty interesting to think about. So at the end of the day, what a wood stove is, is it's a form of heat exchanger. It's an object designed to take thermal energy from the combusting fire inside of it and exchange it out into the room in a safe way. So it separates 
where the chemical reaction is happening from the rest of the room and tries to only transfer the thermal energy to the room while nothing else goes out. Ash doesn't come out, smoke doesn't come out, and so on. Um, and because of the way it's enclosed, it also has the, oops, sorry, it also has the ability to um, regulate the burn rate as well because you can actually control the flow of oxygen into the fire, which directly affects the combustion rate. So it's also used to control the rate of burn. That's one thing I learned early on when I've used uh, wood stoves in the past. If you just let it burn at full blast, you're going to be like sweating in your room very quickly because you, they can actually give off and produce a lot of thermal energy. So you have to really control that system of heat exchanging, control the rate of combustion so that you can control the amount of thermal energy being transferred out to transferred out to the uh, to the room. So the next question is, how does a wood stove heat a room? So the short answer is kind of as implied in this picture is it's transferred using the three different heat transfer mechanisms. And my next question is, what are those three different heat transfer mechanisms? And as you can see in this picture, they are conduction, convection, and radiation. So conduction is heat flow through an actual material. And we'll explain that in more detail here in a minute. Conduction, or excuse me, convection is heat flow through moving fluids. And then radiation is heat flow via electromagnetic waves. So conduction is the flow of heat through the physical material of a solid object. Convection is the heat flow via flowing fluids. And then radiation is heat flow through light, which is electromagnetic waves. All three of these are different mechanisms by which heat can be transferred from hot to cold. All right. So again, conduction is heat flowing through a physical material. All right. And what happens is, as we think about thermal energy being kinetic energy at a small scale, right? If I have, let's see here, if I have my pencil, let's say, it's not a very good conductor, it's an insulator, but my pencil, if I light my little candle here and place the pencil on one side, what's going to happen? The atoms right here are going to heat up. They're going to start moving faster and faster and faster. Well, those atoms are bonded with the atoms right here. So they're going to be bumping into these, causing them to move faster. And down the rod, more and more different, or pencil, I guess, more and more atoms are going to start moving. And so the thermal energy through that motion will actually flow up your object. But the way that the object is constructed, the type of bonds it has, and the freedom of electrons and other things to move around with that thermal energy determines how good it is at conducting heat. So if you ever talk about things being good conductors or being bad conductors, you're really talking about whether or not they allow the thermal energy to easily be transferred through the length of the object via conduction. So in an insulator, things like wood or plastics or ceramics, those adjacent atoms, as they jiggle next to one another, are not very good at passing their thermal energy to one another. They do jiggle and they will gradually pass their thermal energy, but it's a very slow process. In a conductor, something like a metal rod made of maybe aluminum or copper, or in like a pot made of aluminum or copper, the freedom of electrons to move allow the thermal energy to be carried much, much, much more rapidly. I don't know if any of you have run into this, but when I used to like make s'mores when I'd go camping, we'd have like a coat hanger that's made of metal. We'd stick it over the fire, we'd make s'mores on it, and then we'd want to clean off all the burnt kind of leftover marshmallow, and we'd just set it in the fire. If you're not careful, you come back a little while later after the end has been cleaned off by the fire, you grab it, and oh boy howdy, it's super hot because the thermal energy was able to transfer up the length of the coat hanger because it was a metal that had free electrons that were able to move up and down carrying that thermal energy more rapidly. If I were to take that same coat hanger and have it be made out of, let's say, some sort of ceramic or something that doesn't have those free electrons, that process would be very, very slow and inefficient, and it would be likely that I could come and grab the end sometime later, and it would not be very warm. Or what a lot of like 
uh, s'more makers do is they put a wooden handle at the end. So while the metal might get hot, because wood is a very good insulator or very poor conductor, then the wood would not get heated up on the outside, only the very middle inside of it would get heated up by the, by the hot metal. So again, heat flows quickly and easily through a conductor, but not through an insulator. And so I want you to think about conduction and I want you to think of different examples of day-to-day -day life since this is physics of everyday life after all, where you've seen conduction. And we're gonna talk about that in class on Monday. Next is convection. So convection is the heat moving through fluids. So you've probably heard, and I know we've even talked about this a little bit with the hot air balloons and so on, but that hot air rises. Well, that's really uh, just saying that convection occurs, all right? Hot air rising is a result of convection. One fun thing or interesting thing to think about is why. Why do you think it is that hot air rises? Well, it's actually, actually ultimately tied to the idea of buoyancy force. So hot air rises because what happens is as the particles become less dense, this, a set volume of air, as it heats up and spreads out, it's gonna become less dense and therefore it's gonna become lighter than the air it's displacing. And so the hot air is going to rise. And so again, same thing with the candle here. If I lit this candle and allowed it to burn, the air right above the candle would get hot from the flame, from the combustion, combustion, and that hot air would then eventually rise off of the top of the candle. And this would be caused by buoyancy force and would be a demonstration of the idea of convection. In fact, let's do it, let's go for it. I'll light my candle here. Okay, and this is a fascinating thing about candles and similar type devices here. Make the picture big, oh boy howdy, okay? So check it out, I can take my hand and I can put it right next to the candle. I gotta get super close to start feeling the thermal energy. All right, I'm right next to it, not too warm. I feel a little warm, but not bad. I go above, oh right there, it's really hot. I have to go way up here to be like at a comfortable spot because you can almost see the smoke coming up. The convection is happening right above here. The air right here is getting heated up, becoming less dense and therefore less buoyant and it's getting pushed upward, or more buoyant, I guess. It's being pushed upward by the buoyancy force, right? And so again, if I put my hand way up here, way above the candle, I feel about the same warmth here as I do right there. It's wild. Again, I'm almost touching the flame, not too hot, but right here, oh boy, howdy. Okay, so again, convection is a very strong force, especially when it comes to things like this candle. So buoyancy is the driving force behind the idea of convection. Again, warm fluids rise, and this is true not just with air, as we see with my candle here, but also with other fluids like water. If you ever heat a kettle to get boiling water to make hot tea or something like that, the water at the very bottom, nearest the bottom of your stove is heating up and that warm water is going to rise up as it becomes less buoyant, pushing the cooler water at the top down because it's heavier and more dense. And so you get these little circles in your pot that drive the mixing of your fluid to make it so it all heats up pretty uniformly. It's actually quite useful at times. Um, so again, cooler fluids are more dense, so they're gonna drop, whereas warm fluids rise. So again, if I were using this to heat up my room, if this was like a stove here, the hot air would rise, pushing the cool air down, which will then circle back up and be heated up. And so you get these, what are known as convection cycles that occur. And there's other convection cycles that occur that I want you to think about what they are, and we'll talk about it in class on Monday also. The last form of thermal energy is what's known as radiation. So radiation is heat flowing through electromagnetic waves, through light, all right? So again, this guy right here, as you can see, is emitting light. That light is a form of energy. So when I put my hand next to it, I'm not touching it, and I'm not above it, so therefore the only warmth I'm getting is from radiation. There's actually photons, little particles of light being emitted by this candle, and they're bombarding, running into my hand, and making my hand warm up. So things give off heat in the form of electromagnetic radiation. And believe it or not, I right now, standing before you, am giving off light, emitting electromagnetic radiation. I am warmer than the room around me, so I'm constantly giving off light. Now you turn off the lights, I'm not glowing, okay, because I'm not warm enough. But in 
the right wavelengths of light, if you go down into low enough energy, like the infrared light spectrum, which is below the visible light in terms of energy, then you would actually be able to see me glowing. And that's how night vision goggles work. My wife and I have some, and we can look out in the backyard at night and see deer and other animals sometimes glowing very lightly because of their electromagnetic radiation that they're giving off. It's really quite fascinating. It's also amazing to see how well insulated animals are. A lot of animals, you can hardly see them um, even with the infrared camera that we have because they're so well insulated that the outer edge of their fur is about the same temperature as the environment. But it's interesting. It's like their eyes and their face and their nose and their feet that are not as well insulated that you can see the most clearly on the camera. So again, radiation comes in a lot of different types of light, everything from low energy radio waves, microwaves, infrared rays, visible light like this guy, and then all the way up to very high energy things like ultraviolet rays, gamma rays, and x-rays, -ray, x and then gamma rays as well are at the much higher energy side of things. That's why x-rays are dangerous and you have to wear a big vest when getting x-rays taken at the dentist. So again, there's cold waves and there's hotter waves as well. Again, higher temperatures mean that more energy is going to be given off, not only higher energy, but more energy. So the sun gives off energy all across the spectrum, all right? And it's giving off lots of it, and so it's radiating in a lot of thermal energy because it's so high temperature, all right? The other thing too, if you've ever noticed, stoves are a lot of times very dark in color, usually black painted on the outside or made of black kind of cast iron metal and so on. The reason for that is things that are darker in color are more efficient at transferring energy through radiation. All right. And so that's why, for example, things that are lighter in color are more reflective of energy, letting it bounce off and not as good at transferring it, absorbing and then re-emitting it. And so that's why on a warm summer day, if you're wearing a white shirt, you'll feel much cooler than if you're wearing a black shirt because of the efficiency with which it's able to transfer radiation. I'm going to blow my candle. So again, blacker objects, if it's perfectly dark and black, then it will emit and absorb radiation perfectly. But any other color or any other shade there's some level of inefficiency where it's reflecting light and not able to absorb and re-emit as efficiently. All right, so again, going back to conductivity, there are actually equations and way to ways to quantify all of these things, conductivity, radiation, and convection. But because of, for the sake of time and because of complexities of equations and the physics involved, there's only one I want you all to understand, and that's how we quantify thermal conductivity, the rate at which heat is able to transfer through an object based on conduction alone. All right, so if we think about things being transferred, how good of a conductor is going to matter for sure, how big your temperature difference is is going to matter, the size of your object that is transferring the energy is also going to matter. And so what we find is there's a heat flow equation that tells us that the thermal conductivity, which is a constant based on the type of material, it's very high for things like copper, silver, uh, steel even is, is relatively high. It's very low for things like wood, ceramic, air is actually not a very good conductor and so on. So our heat flow equation is the amount of heat, the rate at which energy is being lost is equal to the thermal conductivity multiplied by the temperature difference, multiplied by the area of your object, Okay, and then divided by the thickness. So again, if we went back to my pencil as our example, I'd have to give you the thermal conductivity of this plastic. And then if I put this side in my flame and had the other side outside, then I need a temperature of the flame on this side and the room temperature on this side to give me my temperature difference. The area would be the cross-sectional area of the little circle of the end of my pencil. And then the thickness would actually be the length of my pencil. The thickness is the distance from one temperature to the other. All right, and we're gonna practice with that equation in class on Monday as well, and then you'll get to practice it on the homework too. Here's some different thermal conductivities. These are things that are experimentally determined typically, and they can vary a little bit, but these are pretty reasonable values for thermal conductivity. As you can see, there's some things that are very low, like air, um, fat on our body is used as an insulator. That's why it's, again, a low thermal conductivity. Glass is a decent thermal 
uh, insulator as well in our windows and so on. And then you can see things that are used um, like aluminum, copper, silver are all designed to be very good thermal conductors. And diamond is actually an excellent, excellent thermal conductor as well, which is interesting. So here's a fun question for you all. I just got done making a room in our garage for my wife. I think I told you guys about this, right? And in the wall between the different pieces of sheetrock, I shoved some fiberglass, not shoved, I let it, I left it nice and airy like you're supposed to, but I put fiberglass insulation. Why do you think I did that? And why did I want to leave it nice and airy rather than packing it in as tight as possible? I wonder why. Maybe flip back here and think about why do you think that might be? In fact, the idea of even using fiberglass is kind of interesting, right? If we look, thermal conductivity of air, 0 0.025. The thermal conductivity of fiberglass is 0 0.06, and the thermal conductivity of glass itself is 0.8. So why did I even put it in there? I mean, just air by itself is gonna be a better insulator than the fiberglass. Why would I even bother? Well, the answer is, is because putting the fiberglass in there actually prevents convection from occurring all right so just the air by itself makes a great insulator but it has the freedom to flow and to move and so if i have my two walls here let's let's pop back up here real quick all right if i have my two walls here and here over on this side it's hot because it's inside the room and over here it's cold because it's in the garage so heat wants to move from hot to cold through my wall now if i have air in here that's nice, it's a good insulator, but what happens is the hot air can start to rise off of the hot surface heading this direction and carrying with it thermal energy and then it gets cooled down and circles back. I can get a convection cycle inside of my wall. And so what I do is I take and I put this very loosely packed fiberglass in here. The main goal of the fiberglass is just to prevent convection. So it's this kind of like loose packed stuff that's kind of in here that's mostly made up of air. It's really lightweight and mostly made up of air. But now as air heats up and it tries to go through a convection cycle, it can't. It runs into the fiberglass and it gets blocked. And so you're not able to have convection, but you're still taking advantage of the low thermal conductivity of the air. And so that's really a good way to go. Probably the best way to go on my house, if I could do it efficiently, um, would be to actually pump all of the air out and have absolutely nothing in my walls. And then it would be really super well insulated. The problem is to make a perfect vacuum in your wall is not very realistic and not very efficient, but it does work on other things like thermoses, coffee mugs, and so on. So if you've ever noticed, it's very common to have an evacuated coffee mug, one where the air is pumped out of the edge around your coffee mug to make it more well insulated. Awesome. So the very last thing I wanted to talk about to wrap up this section is the greenhouse effect. So what are greenhouse gases? What's the deal with the greenhouse effect? What is it? It's kind of a bonus question that's touched on in the book but not talked about a whole lot. Well, what the greenhouse effect is, is basically there are gases in the atmosphere that are good at resisting thermal radiation. They're good at acting like a, a blanket almost. Our atmosphere acts like a blanket, keeping some energy out and keeping other thermal energy in on the earth. So when you have different types of energy, visible light can pass through pretty easily and can bounce back out pretty easily. But as visible light comes in, it warms up the surface of the earth, just like it warms up you or me if we're standing outside. But you, me, and the surface of the earth as we give off that thermal energy after we absorb it, we usually give it off at a lower temperature, usually infrared light, as I mentioned earlier. Not, we don't glow in the dark, right? We do reflect some visible light, and that's why we can see each other, but we don't glow in the dark. Instead, we give off infrared light. And infrared light can actually be absorbed and re-emitted by certain types of gases in the uh, atmosphere. And those gases are known as greenhouse gases. And so what the greenhouse gases do is they actually trap, oh, excuse me, they actually trap energy that's trying to leave from you, me, and the surface of the earth and reflect it back to the earth. And so they keep the planet warmer than they would be otherwise. And so the greenhouse effect is not a bad thing. It's in fact, it's needed. If we had zero greenhouse effect and zero greenhouse gases, 
I think the average global temperature would be something like negative 10 Celsius or something, maybe even colder. I can't remember exactly, but it would be much, much, much colder place. So we like the greenhouse effect. But what happens is if there's too much greenhouse gases, then our nice temperate temperatures that we have that are just right for life as we know it on Earth will no longer be the case. If it's too small, it's too cold. And if it becomes too high, then the temperature becomes too hot. So if we have too much of these certain types of gases in the atmosphere, then we run the risk of having an increase in the global temperature, which can have all kinds of unique effects, some of which we've seen already. And so greenhouse gases are actually usually any gas that's made up of two different elements bonded together. So we have water, which is hydrogen and oxygen, carbon dioxide, which is carbon and oxygen, nitrogen oxides, which are different combinations of nitrogen and oxygen, and methane, which is hydrogen and carbon together, as well as other things. These are examples of greenhouse gases. As their levels increase in the atmosphere, it's like making the blanket around the earth thicker and thicker so that it can increase the amount of trapping of temperature on the inside, heating up the earth as a whole. So this is why people talk a lot about being careful about the amount of greenhouse gases we're putting into our atmosphere. So that really wraps up this section and I think it makes my video long enough for now. So anyway, we'll talk about and unpack some of these things in class on Monday, but keep a list of any questions you might have and let me know so that we can discuss them in our next class meeting.